and welcome into the So Rare Data NBA Strategy Show. I am Andrew Laird. You can find me as Lairdinho on So Rare. Joined once again by our good friends from So Rare First Pitch, Alex Hooper. Tilted, who's actually down now today. Oh, wow. Yeah. And <laughs> Gator Guy 231, Keith Jamison, who is right there. Um, it's because I beat you in here, Alex. <laughs> beat you into the chat. That's right. That's a the little like Easter egg of like who shows up first. It's whoever uh, right. who ends up being there. But anyway, <laughs> gentlemen, we took last week off. And I thought that the topic of projections made sense for us to discuss for a whole number of reasons, not least of which that Alex produces projections 85 times per day. <laughs> and anybody who wants those projections can go to So Rare First Pitch. I would start on Twitter and just work your way from there to working to the Patreon. But I feel like there are just a lot of questions about projections or misunderstandings that I thought it was worth talking about because the NBA is just such a heavily projected sport and we use projections so much when it comes to making our lineups and it just felt like something that we should discuss if it was if it's an NBA strategy okay. show and projections are such a big thing and we haven't really broken them down it was time to do that Alex when was the last time you updated your projections what's today Wednesday I mean yes. I I updated them myself this morning I didn't push out an update uh, to the patrons, uh, How How I haven't you? since Tuesday morning. Uh, Sorry. All right, it's refund season. Refund. Season. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoarding all of this bad information to myself. I, I will say, I will say this. Um, it actually might be better that he doesn't, because right. you just produce tons of noise, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, like on a day like today. Um, and then even tomorrow, like the most, I think the, the day that the lineup projections are most important are lock day or maybe like the night before lock day when all the games are about done and you know, nobody else broke their leg. Yeah. Well, I, I try really hard to get updated projections out as soon as the L tens refresh, as soon as we get new ones and, I rush and I rush to do it. And I, I don't know if anyone actually uses them because they're going to just, they're going to change so much. Like there is some amount uh, you can draw from it. You can go and look and be like, all right, these guys have some perceived value now, but how that can change within like the next three days is it's just wild. Yeah. I, I think, I think there are plenty of people who look at them right away just to kind of give an idea of like where, players are at the beginning of the of the game week but like you said like things change so drastically we'll get into like why that happens if you just take a second to think about it like if somebody's going to be out obviously the production that they are responsible for has to go somewhere else it doesn't mean that like the team will produce as much but somebody's going to benefit if somebody else is out and uh, like I said, we'll get into that. Uh, firstly, thank you to everybody who has joined us uh, live in the chat. If you guys could please hit the like button on the video. Anyone who's catching up, you can also hit the like button. Uh, always very uh, helpful. And if you guys haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. There's going to be a lot more coming out of this channel soon, some of which was today, So, other than this video. So definitely uh, subscribe so you can get all of that information. So I actually built some NBA projections like years ago. And that was like my first foray into projections in like what you do to like actually produce something. And that process made me realize that there's no like right way to do projections. There are definitely wrong ways. So like, I don't think it's just like, oh yeah, just like come up with some numbers. But like, there's so many factors that you can put into project into like a projection model that either matter or don't matter. And it's kind of like a trial and error of like what actually matters. But Alex, since you're the one who produces the projections for so rare first pitch, I think it'd be better to start with you on this question of just like, what does a projection actually tell us? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Or maybe what does it not tell us? It doesn't tell you a lot. There's a lot of things it doesn't tell you. The, the main thing is context. Like you need context for this sort of stuff. And while there are situations where like 
well, I guess let me start back at the beginning. What do the proje projections tell us generally with NBA projections, what you're seeing is the average amount of points someone racks up per minute and it's anywhere between like 0.5 and 2 generally falls in that range unless you're Austin Rivers and it's like 0.1. <laughs> um, except when he's not on our teams, of course. Except when we sell except him. Except for yeah. once yeah. he's sold. And once right. he's sold. Yeah. Right. And then he's losing. Um, and then a guess, just a stab at the amount of minutes transposed onto that number of points per minutes. So figuring out what the minutes are actually going to be is the hard part. And um, I use a few different providers who do guess that. I don't have the time to dig into lineups. If this was my full-time job, I would, yeah. uh, but I don't have that. Uh, so that's basically what the projections are going to tell you. And then hopefully you're using a provider who, you know, then takes the amounts of points, rebounds, assists, yada, yada per minute, and actually puts the so rare um, scoring matrix on top of that. But that, that's basically what it is. Points per minute times minutes. That's the simplest way I think you can describe it. And that's the very small baseline though. Yeah. Like, the very intro course where, you know, you don't allow any of the other things to enter into the equation, like pace, like yes. upside projections, things like that, which, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what's important to kind of state is that a projection is not like a fantasy point expectation for that specific moment in time. Like, that's what we use them for. Like projections generally are more reflections of what happened versus like what is definitely going to happen tonight. And so mm -hmm. what, what you try to do with projections is essentially match what you think will happen. Meaning if you think the pace is going to be up in the game tonight for whatever certain, whatever reasons, then guys will, now have a projection kind of like higher than their average. Like if you, if you want to think of like the most basic and I don't even want to put it on a, like a player level, but if you were like trying to project game scores, like the easy way to do it, meaning it's the lazy way to do it is like, okay, how many points does the team average? How many points does the team they are playing give up on average? Right. And you take the middle of that and you're like, okay, that's how many points tonight. Obviously, you have to go much deeper than that when it comes to particularly NBA projections and down into the player projections. But really what we're doing is, is that we're using prior data, meaning things that have happened. And what data you choose is also kind of relevant, meaning do you emphasize the data of a team that's going to play on the road? Do you emphasize what, how they play, how they previously played on the road, how they did against that team? Like you can go down some absurd statistical rabbit holes when like building projections. And it, what's really important is figuring out what actually isn't helpful. That if you are looking at weather for NBA projections, you're probably not helping yourself because they play inside. Although, so, although, although <laughs> it's not really weather. Is more of a travel related issue now? <laughs> I was going to say, do I need um, to add a... I didn't even... Whoa, I didn't even think about that. Now now we're talking about mind-blowing. There's actually... Shoot, there's a lot with the travel. Like, don't was, don't get me started on third and four in Denver. Well, um, well, there's that. I just meant if there was rain in Denver as opposed to not rain in Denver. <laughs> there are a lot, of, no, a lot I, of players make it rain in Atlanta. So that's one thing that maybe you, I should start factoring There you go. In. There's another... <laughs> I'm not sure so, there's, so there's statistical evidence there, but there might be. <laughs> the, the one that came into my head, it was like... Literally, probably my best ever NBA DFS night, but it was like four or five years ago. There was a uh, in Philadelphia. The ice came through the uh, the floor, in the bottom they of the floor. Yeah. They didn't like seal up the Flyers' ice correctly, <laughs> and this was like Embiid was a rookie, or it was his second year, and he's only for like eighteen minutes. And they're like, we can't put Embiid on a floor with water. <laughs> We're gonna kill yeah. the guys. So. So for those of you unaware, uh, there are a lot of 
arenas in the U.S. that have both hockey rinks and basketball courts, meaning they just slap a basketball court on top of the ice. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> there's terrible. Would you say it? <laughs> there's some. Uh, there's a barrier and whatnot. But in certain weather, yeah, like basically the, is it humidity that comes? Like, is it that when it gets too warm that the ice starts to melt and then like it basically seeps through the floor and makes the floor extremely slippery? Um, yeah. Weird stuff like that. So nope, maybe sure. we don't take into account weather enough, but that's a, another topic for another time. Another topic. Um, yeah. Um, to what Jeb Bush, who is with us. Though. Jeb, good to see you. He was saying the Nuggets games are higher elevation. So like that is one that, that's it's like why. you're not necessarily building in how teams do in elevation. You're just saying like how have teams done like how have road teams done in Denver and like that should take care well, of like one of those factors. So can I just on that? I know it's like a little from projections, but like I actually think it's very, very, very important to note, like especially like if you have a player, let's say that they start out on a Friday. Actually, it's better to do with Monday. It's better to use Monday, but. Let's just say over the weekend, they just had three games and four. And that fourth game was in Denver. Like, there are a lot of veterans that will not play that game because they're just sucking wind. Like, they're already struggling to breathe and acclimate to the elevation as it is. So now you have them on a back-to-back -back after traveling. And it's their third game in four nights. And they're just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Or, you know, the, the first half goes, they're down by 20 and just sits out. So if we want to talk about noise and projections, that's where it gets really hard because – all of a sudden, you know, Donovan Mitchell goes from scoring 100 silver points here. And then all of a sudden, let's just say within the next week, it's a third and four in Denver. He plays 22 minutes and scores 10 points. Are you weighing that as his low, low end projection? No, you're actually probably tossing that out as it doesn't matter. And I'm not going to weigh that at all. But if you don't like maintain those things and you are going to weigh it, which is why Man, I'm, I'm going I'm going too far, but I was going to say that this is why a lot of people use median projections more than mm -hmm. average <laughs> to sort out those outliers because you want to see which one so is really more normal and not like skewed by these some of these crazy the, some of the craziness. Yeah, and I actually yeah, think sure. I think it's worthwhile to when you're considering lineups like look at the median projection and like an upside projection like we have because obviously you want to hit all five guys who have a certain amount of upside but if one player's median projections are like plus zero like it's going to be exactly their l10 but their upside's plus 33 whereas their median projection is plus 10 and their upside is plus 33 you get a nice little balance there and you get a lot more things factored into that median projection that are um I guess a little more telling than the upside projection. And there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of things to not consider. And I think that's something that I try to figure out every day when I'm doing my projections, I'm trying to figure out maybe I'm weighing certain things too much. Maybe I'm not weighing certain things enough. And then there are certain things that I just can't pull legitimate data for and factor them in. And that's, it's a, it's a never ending battle. So that's where a lot of that context stuff, comes in like I, I know my projections don't factor in the whole like bigs against the hornets thing which is yeah. undeniably a thing like any center that plays the hornets has to be scoring 20 percent over their normal you know output yeah but shouldn't that i mean theoretically you have data in there about how like what the hornets give up yeah it's just not that's a pace. You you can do the pace adjustment easier, but adding in DVP, so that's essentially what we're calling defense versus position. That's just a whole another level of sorting and extra because on top of that, you have some guys that don't really play that position. So like yeah. you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. is a power forward for the Grizzlies, except for he plays a ton of minutes at center too. Like when Steven yeah. Adams off the court, they normally try to stagger them. And he's either the five or is Brandon Clark the five. So who's actually the five that's going to play the Hornets, <laughs> right? So that, that part's like really tough. And that's where, again, where you can get really noisy on projections. And kind of what Alex was alluding to earlier, you know, I and mean, we've done better, the IKB, right? Like, okay, I know better. Like, you know, the the projection doesn't say that this matchup is awesome, but – 
I've looked back through and the nine straight guys have just absolutely mashed Mason Plumley. So we're just going to go ahead and, and run that. And more yeah. often than not, it's the opposite where the projections like this guy rocks. And it's like, no, it's PJ Tucker. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and, and that's too, though, like I was going to ask you to say this, but like on the PJ Tucker one too, like, it makes sense because there's a long enough track record that he does okay, but you just go, like it's it's great for like the numbers per L10, like what we we call it, you know, points per L10 essentially, which is here's the projection, here's what his L10 is. So for every L10, you get 1.9, and that makes him 19 plus nine. Okay, he rates decently, but you know, if all of a sudden you slide over to PJ Tucker's upside, it goes wow, his upside is the same as his projection. That's not that great. <laughs> so one guy you mentioned along those lines, I thought it was interesting this week was Draymond Green. And I looked at my projections. His upside Thanks, projection, Larry. his upside projection was lower than his median projection. Because, <laughs> because of the way That's that fun. it's it's based on um shot volume and usage. Oh, okay. And because he's so far under the league average, yeah. it just knocks his his points per minute down. So I thought that was interesting. See, that's, of course that's such a, it. I didn't even think of that. That's just such a fun conversation. Cause I jump into our little chat and I go two picks for you guys this week. And they're both probably horrible on your projections, but like, yeah. I'm more of the, like, I know better guy. Yeah. And I'm like, Ben Simmons, dream on green too low. And Alex is probably like, looks at his friend. She goes, they're going to combine for five shots. This week. <laughs> I, well, I, I think knew why. The, yeah, I think the issue though is is simply that upside generally comes from scoring, and right. it's really hard to like. We see Jaron Jackson's big games come when he has like six blocks, right. and that's really hard to project. Like blocks are extremely hard to project, and sure. they're random seemingly. And they're not, it's not even like, I don't even want to say like DVP because it's like, if, if you like a team looks like they just get blocked a lot, like it's something like that. And you're like, Oh, well, this is a good block game. Like that doesn't exist. And you don't have good <laughs> block games. And so like you have this problem with, and I've, I've like not complained at Alex about this, but I basically have complained to Alex about this, that like guys like Jackson and miles Turner, they like, project well in certain instances because they're like, Oh, well, yeah, they could have a lot of blocks tonight. And it's like, but if they don't have those blocks, they're not like remotely close to their upside right. because they, they just don't score. And so, yeah. So Keith, it was like Draymond green. <laughs> I think Alex and I were both like, what? <laughs> like, what are we going to do with that? Keep and, in mind, I, I bought Draymond like immediately after. So, <laughs> and the result was what? 51, 50. It was more than that. Wasn't it? It might, I, I think the layers. I think I think I think your message to be layered was like, "What's his upside? Like thirty two? And I think I'm like, "No, it's more like 40. So I mean, in in your defense, I didn't even put like fifty as an output, and it was an overtime game, and it was it like so on the DFS side of things where we do daily projections, like the uh, that everybody that night from Atlanta and Golden State was popping like Kevon Looney was a popular DFS play that night because the pace of that game was sure absurd. Yeah. What did Clay take? Like Clay ended up having what like 60 points or 50 points. Clay had something insane, but he took like 30 something shots. It's crazy. He had 54 points on 10 threes. Okay. That that'll do he it. He took uh 39 shots. Jesus. And Poole took 31. <laughs> So and Draymond quick, took one five. Dray, Draymond had five points. <laughs> While we're talking about the defensive guys, That's absurd. really like Green and Jackson and Turner and all those, their projections are going to say like what happens if they get those blocks and score a ton, and how how often does that happen? Like, Laird, you know very well, Jaron Jackson's always at the top of my upside. Like, at it. And we're just waiting for that day where one, he plays more than 22 minutes two he gets a number of blocks and actually is doing the scoring. It's just like, that's, 
like even within the projections, my projections specifically, there's a certain amount of IKB and it's all of those guys. It's all of those defensive guys. And that's why uh, PJ Tucker pops too, is because you're like, oh yeah, he's going to go get 10 rebounds and maybe a couple of steals and blocks. And it, he doesn't have to score, but if he does, and that's kind of what you're looking at. And that's a thing I was talking earlier about like constantly fighting this battle where I'm trying to find what to kind of pull back on and what to kind of boost. And it's the defensive guys who, who keep popping. Like, Bol Bol was popping super early. It's because he had, like, a 19% block rate in the first <laughs> five to ten games. And it was like, all right, if he keeps doing this, then I'm going to keep playing him. Then his L10 caught up, and all of a sudden, he it was just well, a real meh play. And you know what the funniest part, like, a Bol Bol is? And this is where, you know, projections get really screwy. So they actually moved him to, like, this hybrid, like, three roll where he was away from the basket a ton too. Mm-hmm. So it was like they started the season and it was like Wendell Carter and they thought he could put down with like Paulo and Paulo was playing more three. And then they switched it out because the magic has everybody in the, the floor has to be seven feet tall to play for the magic. <laughs> but I mean, it's just crazy. So like you, like to your point, you can't account for that until the data catches back up. Right. So Bull Bulls, you know, block rate is 19% as he's playing center. And then all of a sudden the coach decides that, no, no, he's a seven foot two small forward. We're going to pull him away from the basket. Yeah. You know, the data is going to take a while to make up for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we wanna... do Mike's question real quick? Because I think this is good for European or anybody that doesn't know the NBA. There, there, well. I was going to say, there are a few ask... comments I want to hit hit up in the chat. Yeah, some good. Yeah. Did you want to do that one real quick? Just since sure. I added up the... So he asks, home court advantage has as much influence as it can in other sports for the home team or is more about visitor schedule. Um I'm going to take my stab, then I'm curious what you guys... Ooh, that's a new, that. awesome feature later. Look at that. Blocking the beard. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry Alex. Making it look more red. For, for <laughs> those that are on pod, the, the, the question appeared on Alex's face. But um, anyhow, uh, my, my answer is it doesn't matter as much, except for I always feel better about stars playing their full role and not sitting at home than away like LeBron does not sit nearly as much at home as he does away games so like if I have a star that I'm expecting two game weeks for him but like I see that Denver back end game you know I'm kind of worried that I might only get one from him versus if it's two straight home games I'm feeling pretty good what's your take who <clears throat> do you see much other difference no, not unless it's a not unless it's a pace situation because some teams pace up a little more at home, whereas mm-hmm. they don't, don't away. And those those differences are really marginal. Like I'm looking for like Charlotte's really slow at home but gets sped up away. I don't know why that is, and that's like I mean, one of the few is, situations. Can I, put, Port, Portland. can I put another fun one on Charlotte's projections on pace too, which sucks? <laughs> they play much faster than Lamelo's, and he's missed half the season. That's true. Yeah. So. See. So yeah, that I mean, so more, that's just more context. That's another thing that like, yeah, I can look at my Anthony Simons projection. He's projecting for 60 points, but Dame Lillard didn't play for X amount of games. So like yeah. his shot volume is going to keep going down, 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 and that data has to catch up. So yeah, it's just a matter of you do still have to know the league and you do have to know beyond injury news to like really get an edge. And the numbers are very seldom going to tell that story. So I'm going to try to combine a few of these questions because they kind of apply to what we're talking about here. The first comment that I have to bring up though is that uh, Jeb here is saying that plum dog millionaire slander will not be tolerated. Um, but I think it's- I love, I love that man. It's just the projection speaking. Sorry. Just, it's just layer, layer. get bigs against plum, the hornets. Plum dog, do you know what plum dog millionaire is, by the way? Do I know who he is? Or yeah, what but do you, you mean? know why he said plum dog millionaire? I well, I know who he's talking about. I don't know where it comes from though. No. So there's a music video you have to look up. And he it was my icon on DraftKings for a while. And he has a little toy gun shooting one dollar bills, and it's a song. It's plum dog millionaire. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll slander as many Duke players as I want, by the way. Yeah, there, there it is. That's exactly where I was heading with that. Especially Thank if you, you allow much, 50 points a game to you, right? Right. So <laughs> we're talking about away games, and we had 
kind of mentioned the Atlanta flu. I don't know how far I want to go down this road, but Ransom Reed also brought up whether we should be factoring in strip clubs for James Harden's projections. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the same. That's the same um, issue as the flu. So, right. So they're one and the same. So do you? Is it pace? It's not even pace down for the Hawks because they probably play fast, but you're just not catching up if you're playing in Atlanta. Is that the? What column on your spreadsheet is that in? There's there's the been hang, a lot of unexpected. Let's just put it this way: there's a lot of unexpected late absences in Atlanta. If you watch day to day, that's but true. again, but within that, but within that too, you see that in Utah, not for the flu incident for yeah. elevation, and you see that in Denver a ton is the the big one, and then the other one that you kind of have to watch for again, like. This is like next level if you really wanted, if you really are digging into it and like, you know, you have a big gallery or multiple competitions or really, really wanting to put in the work. Um, you'll see a lot to where it's just a quirk in the NBA schedule and they go east to west coast. I was just about to say that. Like a back, on like a back to back, back to back days. And somebody like, Le, like a LeBron or like, you know, Dwayne Wade when he was playing was very famous for it. Like there was no way they're going to play. So that happened like, two or last week last week the lakers played in orlando on tuesday and then home on wednesday yeah which seems absurd to me that you would ever he probably played game. both he probably played both though because the second leg was home but if you flipped it around he probably sits in orlando sits that one right but do you even like somehow build in something that you're like they're gonna be not as good I think that you just have to kind of go just know it. And I mean, you can maybe make that make, you know, a determination of if like you have LeBron and Ja Morant, for lack of a better term. And like, it's truly like a coin flip. And you go, well, Ja's two games are split apart and they're both at home and LeBron has a back-to-back home away. You know, there's a chance I might only get one out of LeBron. Or right. if the Lakers go behind quick on the second end, he's more likely to sit. There were, so maybe you decide that that's going to be your tiebreaker. We kind of have a that coming this game week, right? Did, did I see today? Yeah, Embiid. So Mike Zakarian on his morning show was talking about, or maybe it was on Live Before Lock on Monday, but he was basically thinking that Embiid would take one of the games off this week. So he was like, oh, I'm going to play Paul Reed. Cause like if Embiid sits, then Reed should play. And then Embiid that. plays absolutely smashes Reed. I'm not sure Reed played a single minute on Monday. Might not have, but now Embiid is questionable for tonight's game. And it's like, Oh, here we go. But do you remember a few streams ago? I think I kind of brought it up. Um, as that kind of almost like being like this next level GPP, like big prize pool, big tournament takes is you take that kind of stand and it's a lot easier to take that stand and like limited. And maybe like if you're prioritizing champion, like limited contender or rare contender, like you take that risk and you're more less priority lineup. Like it takes big, you know, what to go, this is my champion, super rare lineup where I have Jokic, Doncic, and I'm going to play Paul Reed on the hope that <laughs> like that. I mean, I would give somebody huge props and if they want it, I've been like, you know, you deserve that. Like that's a big kahuna's move, you know? So to add on to that, uh, because I, I can't remember if Mike, I'm going to give Mike credit for this, but I can't remember if he was the one who said it, but along those lines, but instead of that example, you actually play Embiid and Paul Reed. Cause you know, oh, yeah. Like same lineup, and then Tyus Jones and John Morant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. I thought exactly. about that. I love that on. I love that on a three gamer too. Mm -hmm. Like I think that on three gamer that becomes even easier. Like Sean was talking about to me, but he Sean was like, I kind of hate the three. The good one, my guys have three games because there's inevitably depending on the type of player, it's going to be a zero in there or just a big outlier. So I think it's interesting. Uh, do you think, well, no, I mean, like clearly three games allows you to play guys that you probably wouldn't play on a two game week. Right. Yeah. I played exactly. I mean, it opens it up a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love Terry Eason, man. That guy. I, know, is- I do too. I do too. I, I mean, I need more than a 10 out of him, but, uh, but like with he and I played Eric Gordon too, because the Rockets had three games and I was like, all right, Eric Gordon's got to go off one of these games. And he went off in the first one, but now I'm like, all right, give me that second guy. And there's so much variation and you even get with the schedule too. I'm looking at the schedule here um, on, let's see, the seventh is Saturday. The Bulls are playing a back-to-back. It's, their third game in four days, and it's the back end of a back-to-back against Utah. It's in Chicago. And then also the That's Spurs seven. are playing the same sort of thing. I get So, like, Boston plays the Spurs on Saturday in San Antonio where there's nothing to do. And it's <laughs> it's the third it's the, and four. It's the anti-Atlanta trip. <laughs> yeah, right. I love San Antonio. That river walk's the best. But <laughs> it's great for playing Pokemon Go, and that's about it. Um <laughs> But my point, my point being, is that Boston probably smash, and like I, I think there's something to be said for looking for statistical outliers there. I like how we the the name of the episode is let's talk about projections, and we're talking about like nothing but context, and I think that's fine, but it's funny. There's so there's just so many other things that you well, have to consider. Let me just make a comment to that, like where you said lots to talk about projections because. I do think the reality with projections is most people are just literally like using it exactly what we just said. Like he's projected for 30, his L10 is 20. He's a good play. And that they're not. And that's, I think where Laird even maybe wanted to go with this was if you just do that, like you're, it's better than having nothing at all. And just going, I think these guys are the best play without any sort of baseline, but it's also risky to not understand how the how the projections are come up with and then you're just like i blame alex's projections or i blame rotowire or i blame whatever thousands of places are out there without just understanding it's not anything fixated this is how it came up to it and kind of on that (laughs) alex is spot on in pokemon go that's an amazing comment (laughs) hey one of the one of the best weeks of my life playing pokemon go on the river walk um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you walk and find bars and you can find Pokemon. What's better than that? Uh, oh what could be better? <laughs> nothing. Literally nothing. Um, oh, God. What was I going to say? It threw me off. Um, oh, I was just going to say, like, so it's over FP. We have a $5 tier where you can just get the projections. And then there's a $10 a month tier where you can get the projections and the Discord. And I found that most of the people who sign up for the $5 and just the projections, they subscribe for like a month and then kind of sign off. And I think like, this isn't a plug or anything, but I'm just saying like, that's because we, it is, I kind of, we have the context, we have the context and it's just so important because even just for like having somebody to tell you, don't play PJ Tucker. It's, it's a big difference. Yeah. Where did Austin Rivers fall in that discord? I can't tell. I can't remember. Hey, we we were all like, "Don't play him! Don't play him!" And then you know, and then what was it like? Forty burger? Yeah, might have been fifty. Oh my god, it was a a lot. Flashback to high school for him. Oof, gosh. (laughs) Um, To go back to the Paul Reed thing, Jeb was saying he played Paul Reed in his common champion team. I have him in common contender, so I went with it. So I'm blaming Mike if that doesn't work out. The the non uh, projection question I wanted to touch on came from Ransom Reed here about playing yep. duos uh, like yep. Ja and Jaron or Luca and Wood, Jokic and Jamal Murray. Where do you guys fit in that? Because we, I feel like it was one of the things we talked on like early on, like one of our first shows. And it was just like, oh, do you, is it worth stacking, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like in DFS, we tend to see game stacks more than we do see uh, like individual like single team stacks i don't think anybody's realistically playing like five guys from one team i don't even know if you can if you're allowed to do it now that i've said that but um where do you guys fall on at least playing two guys from the same team i'll let you go first hoop i think i was anti for a minute but so 
how many if it were dfs it's one thing where there's like oh you can say maybe there's some correlation here but you know one guy might nuke the other guy's numbers i think generally i tell people in the chat like be aware that one guy might kind of steal a big game from the other but there's nothing to say that one like Jokic can't have a big game one day and then murray has right. a big game the next day but you're still kind of cutting the odds of that a little bit and that's where i kind of worry correlation's not terribly terribly strong uh, at least positive correlation is not terribly, terribly strong in the NBA. But I think having more than one game, as I kind of relate everything to DFS with NBA, having multiple games, I think, just increases the variance on both sides by so much more. So there's an opportunity cost of not, like, finding a better play in that second spot. But I think there's something to be said for, you know, like if you're playing a single game DFS tournament, maybe I don't want to play Darius mm -hmm. Garland and Donovan Mitchell together, but there's a little more room for that in so rare. Maybe that's not the best example, but it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not as anti as I was, and right. it's more of an opportunity cost thing. And like, if those are the two best options in your gallery, just play them. That's... That's where I was going to sit with that question. Like, as I just was sitting back for, it's actually really funny. Like we should do like a look back show at some point, because I think like my thoughts on so much when we started out to where we're at now has changed like 180 um, on things, but specifically with uh, what you just said about that, I think it all depends on their L10s because if you're telling me Garland and Mitchell both have 50 L10s, I'm saying no way in hell. Like, okay. because it's so hard for them both to achieve that. Because, and those are both like ball hawk type of guys. Like, they both need the ball to do well. Whereas, like, Jokic and Murray, not so much because Jokic is so many more assists. And then, like, even Doncic and Wood is better than Doncic and Dinwiddie, so to speak. Like, so I thought the correlations that he did are actually pretty decent. And then like Mike Basson said, Scotty Barnes and Trent. Well, Scotty Barnes is better when he doesn't shoot. So he's kind of in that Draymond Ben Simmons mold that he's better off not shooting the ball and just kind of dunking it or getting rid of it. So like those type of correlations make sense more than, you know, I think Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum is not a good combo. Right. Yeah. So because like, they both need points. So I was, I was going to start this by saying that I tend to accidentally stack because of projections where I'm like, oh, my highest projected team includes two pistons. And then I know I just need to start over. But like you, I think it's the lower cap guys that where it's okay. Like mm -hmm. when, when the Timberwolves had all those injuries, and then all of a yep. sudden it was like, oh, do I play Jalen Noel and Austin Rivers? Or with or the Jaylen Warriors, Noel, like and play... Naz Reed. Or not right. No or one Reed. With the Warriors, do you play like DiVincenzo and Kuminga when he was healthy? And like stuff like that. And it's yeah. I feel like it's easier to play two of those guys because their roles are so much bigger. But generally, like I don't like the, the example you had, like playing Garland and Mitchell together seems nuts. Like, it just seems like a total right. waste because, you, you know, we do see games sometimes where two of these stars pop off at the same time, but it's just like, it's such a 90th, 99th percentile outcome that you're just like yep. setting yourself to just have one bad game. And theoretically, if they have two games in the game week, then like, it feels like you can use that as an excuse for making a mistake, <laughs> but like, it just doesn't seem optimal to take two guys from the same team. If you if you're playing right. them as if you need sixty or seventy from from each of them, so I think too within that question, like this is back to like projections and noise, which I feel like I've said noise like ten times already. So you're like you got to be like really careful with uh, results noise on that because if the game goes a double overtime, you go like ah, oh, I told you stacking works, and it's like it worked great in double overtime and it sucked when they had one game and they lost by 30 and both of your guys did terrible because neither one played their full minutes. So it's just really tough. Yeah. It, 
it does seem like I, I'm looking down at my limited champion lineup this week and I have James Harden in it. It's like, I would just never play Embiid and Harden together. Maybe sure. I should. I, that, that, I feel like that one could work except for that their Eltons are always going to be so high that you just can't right. make a lineup. Well, yeah, one of I, them would be an MVP. Sorry, not all of us have not with your start not with your Giannis. Yeah, now that's right. I yes. think shout out to Laird by the. Hold on, I'm sorry. Alex, I'm going to just say it for forget. Shout out to Laird for still not buying Luka Doncic and just going next level. <laughs> I'm going to buy everyone except Luka. You're like black with Carl's. You're like with black with with Carl's Hill. Yes, that's buy. exactly what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah, I get it. What were you going to say, Alex? Sorry. Batting down the hatches and weather. I'm doing the same thing, man. I'm, I'm waiting for the Luca times to pass. I was just going to say. You, um, you've, you've had him twice. Yeah, I know. I bought him back because <laughs> I, I profited both times I sold yeah. him. And and the, on average, the, uh, we, me and Alex have each had him once. So yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sharing the love. love. Um, I was just going to say it's more like. It, it makes more sense with low L10 guys. Like, I don't think you're going to play LeBron and AD together. I don't think you're – but, like, last night, if you see Shea and uh, – <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you see Shea's out, like, Jalen Williams and Josh Giddy makes a ton of sense. And if, right. by some miracle, you did that, not knowing that Shea was going to get sick, and then <laughs> at the Thunder were going to put up 150 on the best team of the league. The Celtics. <laughs> then was... you, did, you did great. I don't think the that projections had that. But why not? No, I'm just kidding. Ransom we Reed is wondering why they can't buy Kemba Walker yet. I, I don't because you know, he might be out of the league before they met him. You don't you, you don't want to buy those cards. That's what all so sometimes Walker. saves us from ourselves, and that's one of those situations. <laughs> yeah, unless he's a long term UConn fan and he wants a Kemba jersey meant from college. Okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> I, that's uh, literally the only situation I'm willing to accept. <laughs> I had a graphic, like, artist project, like, media project in college one time. It was when the Cavs got the first pick. And I did, like, a, a fake billboard for the Cavs. And I was like, it was like the future. And it was Kemba Walker and Derek Williams instead of Kyrie. Oh, and my God. <laughs> Justin Thompson. Uh. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't listen you know to me. Although I the, did want quiet. Dark, some of the dark days of DFS when there was a lot gone and a Euro League was one of the things. Derek Williams became a player in Europe. Yeah, mm. man. For Nick a very Lathis. short amount of time. He was a very good college player. Oh, my player. God. Uh, yeah. Nick Lathis. That's back to my gate. I was going to say. He, has, he had no hair by the time he was like 24. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but he, that jumper was wet, though. That's all that mattered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is Kemba Walker Walker a good play if Luca is out? <laughs> um, so he had one game he went absolutely nuclear, <laughs> but Spencer Dinwiddie was out too. So he's fine, and it, it depends what his L ten is. If his L ten is twenty or twenty five, then no. What is his L L10? ten? Is if his L ten is eight, then it's probably fantastic. I'm trying to figure out. Here it is. Kemba. Yeah, he had a 52. <laughs> yeah. Against, against my Cavs. 32 right. points, five rebounds, seven assists. But correct me if I'm wrong, because I remember that game because I may have passed on him in DFS thinking that his minutes were limited. But um, he played 41 minutes. He was there. Which is but then when he wasn't there, right? right? It was, yeah, no, it was Wood, Bullock, Hardaway, and DFS. Right. Dorian Finney Smith. No, but no, but again, so the problem is, is Dinwiddie's going to move over to point and steal a ton of usage when Luca's out. Yeah, I just don't think he's should be fine. That's a... <laughs> I mean, again, though, but like this is the one cool thing about Soder because on a one, like you don't want Austin Rivers, but on a one week game week, if all of a sudden everything the cards are full, right, you can go like, hey, Austin Rivers is maybe defendable. Then you play him wasn't so good but like you know the numbers and everything aligns that hey like there's a way there's a route to him overachieving his l10 which is all we're actually trying to do he had 22 fantasy points on monday how about that who kimba rivers oh okay i was gonna say i think kimba the problem though too is 
I didn't expect this much time on Kemba Walker. But I think the issue is I think he DNPs a lot too. So I think I don't think he's like guaranteed in the rotation. I'm not gonna lie, I haven't Dallas is so weak past Luca, it's really hard to study the rotation. Let me see here. Yeah, they don't have cards. So while you're looking at that, uh, this is the, I'll give this to Alex. Uh, approach contender tournaments, a rather balanced lineup. Depends. Yeah, are you are you still in the same <laughs> there? Or is it week to week? Uh, it depends. It depends on... So I have a couple of guys. I haven't bought any big dog rares. Um, so like I'm sitting in that Van Vliet, Lillard... Shea range where like you can make a decent contender lineup with Shea on a 46 or Lillard on a 45 or even Van Vliet on a 41 you th- that 10 points like up to like a 55 to like a true stud yeah. in contender it's yeah you can't do it so um I've had success both ways I've had success with the the Shea and a bunch of 10 to 19s and I've had some success with like a 37 like Bama Adebayo is a really solid contender play a lot of times like a 37 he can put up like a 51 to 59 and same with like DeRozan again DeRozan is a perfect player for that slot even like at his best he comes in where like 40 41 what was it player he was was uh, 39 for a while but he's like much higher now he's at he's at some he's at 44 yeah He's so at like 44, and he's got a 68 that's going to pop in next game week. Jeez. Yeah, right. So he was that guy there for a really long time. But that's the kind of guy that you can fit into contender. Um, the I dudes who are in the low 40s who can go easily for a plus 20. There are guys like that all the time, and I'm sure I could pick up a couple. Morant on a 43 right now. Donovan Mitchell's on a 38 for now. <laughs> but those... But those two are like, I've noticed when building that it immediately though makes you get people into that like low teens to 10 yeah. range. Like you've got to have those options yes. or you might have been much better off finding those 25 to 30 guys that get the boosts during the week. Like, you know, we've got the Pelicans coming up now without Zion for a good amount of time. So you, know, you got like the Jackson Hayes. I know I picked up four contender. There you go. Um, I, I picked up Joe Val as probably my stud because I think I want to say he was at 30 and he gives you that 50 plus upside. Yeah. I think those are the guys that I, for contender, I've seen, I feel like those are the lineups I see consistently at the top are the 30s that outperform versus, you know, trying to find. Again, this is back to like two weeks ago. And I was on the other side versus like the tens that overperform. And I'm like, no, 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 find the tens that overperform. And now here I am saying, actually, I think it's back to the 30s. I really do think like silver NBA is just so fluid like that. Like it really just depends week to week. I think for contender, look at the player, the best player you're considering. Look at his L10, add 25. If that's a realistic output for him, then you can play him. Like if I look at Shea on a forty-five, oh, yeah. like seventy, yeah, you can do that. I don't think it's. I'm but getting... like what, when I look at Luca at sixty-six, and I'm like eighty-one, yeah, you can do it. But yeah, I like I like what Barclay has just put. Like Clay Thompson, Garland, R.J. Barrett for a while before the mysterious injury. Uh, that De'Aaron, all, yeah. De'Aaron Fox on a thirty. I mean, were you watching that game, Laird? Uh, you're a Knicks fan. I, I still don't so, know what happened. I did not watch the game, but I saw the underdog tweet that he was like going to the locker room with a, he was going to a locker room Hand. and somebody who, somebody like replied to the tweet, like, it's just a scratch on his hand. He's fine. And like we have not heard from him since it's been like a week and a half, but you watch the video and you're like, what happened? I'm not sure what happened there. There are a lot of like <laughs> really like... small bones in your hand. And that worries me because like. It was a cut. It was a it was a like big laceration on his palm, I think. So when he catches the ball, yeah. it like is pulling that apart. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean I think that, that I, know I had him in a lot to go on. Killed that. Yeah, killed not to go down that, that route, but like I do think that in contender, 
those matter. But, you know, maybe the reason that champion, it's still where you need those other guys to perform because we're just seeing some of the most insane ceilings recently, right? Like Luca, Luca over 100, Mitchell over 100, which somewhat was predictable. No Garland, you know, opens up that type of upside. Um, I'm sorry. Luca, I'm sorry. what? The what? The hundred was predictable. No, I'm saying just I'm having a crazy upside game. Okay, okay. You told me that the Cavs are completely, and there was no Mobley too. Yeah, yeah. So I just you go. I just knew that I saw the out. I saw the Garland news, and I was like, oh, do I want to get Mitchell? And I'm like, ah, Levert's L10 so much nicer. I'll just go there. It's I mean, always Laird, it's always the other guy. Laird, you could be me who saw that Garland was going to be out for the game week, so bought two of them. And played neither. Mitchell? Yeah. Oh, that's dumb. Sitting on my bench. Yeah. yeah. With a in. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I had I had two Pistons guys that I could move in, and the projections told me that the Pistons might be a little bit better. Oh, no. The real move was uh, <laughs> Mobley's out, so Love's moving in the starting lineup. So it's I had, I had Kevin Love. No, I, I, have, I had Kevin Love in the lineup. But maybe I didn't want too many calves. <laughs> I didn't play. Like I didn't play Jetty. my Kevin Love. Would you have played him with uh, Mitchell if you had him? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I would. Have. Well, can I just bring this up? So can, let's just give context to that question. Mitchell on a thirty-eight and Love on a nineteen. And now you say they're both starting. That's fine. But Mitchell on a forty-eight and Love on a twenty-five. You're like sure. No. So like yeah, with with two games like yeah, um, I'm okay with running that just because Kevin Love is on a 19 because Thank he can you, score because he can score 38 and 19. Ah, Mike, Mike Basson, come on, man. He said that's 100 percent do it for a moron. For uh, a I mean, I mean, I, yes, it was, but. Like literally, I, I sat there and I want to say that the way I wanted the lineup, I, I can't recall. I, I'm going to plead the fifth, but I, it was something like I put Mitchell in, and I was left with like a ten, and I was like, I got I got nothing here at a ten, and then I like looked real quickly through the projections, and I'm like, there's nothing I really like. So, and I think the way I balanced it, out, I think it was like Bogdanovich from Denver or Detroit with Burks fit versus Mitchell and something else. I can't remember how it would have worked out, but I, I hate my life, but it's, I hate my decision there. So yeah. um, Barkley's brought this up. I okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm, you're asking about it. I'm pulling this lineup up because it's one of the most absurd things I've seen in a, in a while here. This is first place in limited contender. We've talked oh about this. We've talked about if this is viable. You just need so, someone. To, that was, if, well, that was a throwaway. That was a throwaway. Just, if you just, if one of your guys scores 71 points, you're good. What is – so bayheim has got to be a zero, right? Yes. Yeah, he's a zero. He's not and even with the team. Here we go. Pretends is a nine. Actually, that was – that's after – oh, I mean, it might still be nine, but that's actually the current. He was a nine? <laughs> he currently is. He got, a, he got a minus eight. Let me uh, see. Hold on. A nine – and he's working on it. Wow. Minus two and a 1.2. Anyway. So, yeah, we talked about this. Uh, Alex, how often do you look at total projected points for a lineup? I consider it every time I put it together. And how often do you drop a guy with a zero? My it? When I run my optimizer in Excel, just about every time it comes up with somebody with like a zero to four L10. And I have to be like, no, I'm not doing that. Is that due but to upside? It is Why are you doing upside. Uh, Because my upside scores are capped at a hundred. And it's basically like, yeah, if you play Luca and KD and Luca scores a hundred and KD scores 94, you don't need, you can play a zero. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. Whereas in this lineup, it kind of did. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. Hmm. I so I did buy the it was just for contender or not for contender, it was just for limited champion last week. I bought Terry Taylor because he was a one to try to fit something in. It, I, I finished just out of the rewards and Taylor actually had DNP'd for like four straight, and then I think it was a blowout and got like eight points in blowout run. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this might actually work out. But I 
somebody else I had just didn't. Show, so I, I think it's very viable. I think I think I would much rather try to find if it was like Burton's and Bayheim. I would probably overthink it and try to find. So we said Burton's was at a nine. Let's say Bayheim was a zero, so nine. I'd probably try to find like a six and a three or just two guys that are definitely on the roster just so you have that like one outer. You know, somebody said Kankar. I don't know if you remember, but Kankar like a couple weeks ago had a random game where he played a ton and got like 30. Um, you know, maybe something like that where I think Buddy Beheim is in the D- the G League. So Did- I probably not want to have that. Does it even matter though if they're – like, are you really going out of your way to right make, there. Sure, make sure you get somebody? I mean, if I'm sitting there, because they're all going to be a dollar or two bucks. If it's limited, I probably would spend an extra minute and just look down there, especially if I had projections, right? Because now I can sort by that and I can see of the guys that are just zeros across the board. And then maybe have one that literally, you know, has a projection by it. You're trying to figure what the hell happened there, Larry. I love a good wash trade. <laughs> Sorry, for those listening, I'm pulling up Ryan Archie Giacomo's limited charts right now. <laughs> 0.107 and 0.139 for his limiteds. You can ignore that I own five Ryan Archie Giacomo cards. But should I be ripping this card in limited now? I mean, if you want to put two? on his... Hold on. If you want to give him some wins in his career record in your gallery, then maybe... I don't know. It looks tempting. I don't know. I think it's, I, I just will say, I think it's viable. Now, I would not, I, I do not think that two zeros is viable. Well, I think that's, that's what's wild. kind of crazy about this contender lineup. I don't even, I think I lost it. That's here. wild. Is that it basically has two zeros? Like it's not even just one. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, good for him. I'm playing with Jaden Springer lineups now. I don't even know who that is. Yeah, exactly. He's a three on Philly who like hasn't played, but I'm trying to like shoehorn him into some of my lineups and see what I can do. But, like, I mean, there's definitely some guys though that are on the end of benches that shoot. Like, what was the, you played the the couple of dudes from Orlando after all the suspensions? I mean, like, everybody, um, I can't. I played Terrence Ross and uh, Kevin Harris. But what was Kevin Harris? That that was who I was seven. And then, you, but the but Schofield ended up being the play. Yeah. What was Schofield? Do you know offhand? I, he was like, I think, uh, I was going to say eight or nine, but I think it might have been higher. I think it might have been closer to 15 okay. or something. Maybe that's harder. If there's a negative cap guy. I bet you he spikes negative cap. Does that actually work? Is that a thing? Yeah. Yes, it do does. You cap back? Yes, you do. Oh, now that might be a strategy show in itself. <laughs> That's very interesting. You get cat back. Yeah, but it's that like it's definitely a mistake it's like in the three. algorithm. Yeah, there you go. Everyone go get your Alondis Williams. <laughs> Hold on. What does it did his price spike at all off of the negative? That would be unbelievable. No, I'm assuming it I don't even understand what I'm looking at. There you he go. definitely people are trying it. Wow. Nice job, Thomas. Somebody said Hold on, do you, Thomas, do you have the, can we go to contender? Is it rare or limited? Really the only, I think somebody in chat He only has one in game. chat has this. Larry, can you go, Thomas, what uh, competition is it? Contender, Third contender. or limited? Uh, is it rare? He's saying he has a minus three. Mad props if you did that. I mean, I don't know anything about Alondis. Williams, other than he's at a minus three, and that seems bad. So, yeah, if you can get money for him, I probably would. <laughs> uh, third in rare contender. Oh, that's not a negative game. Wow, that's a nice go, no, uh, go that maybe the next one. Limited, limited contenders there. Go there it is. He was in the top lineup, too. Sixth. He's sixth. That's fantastic. And Drew Eubanks with the massive. So, you really have two zeros in there to get Mitchell and Young. Wow. Okay. And you get you got to get the massive what plus twenty, plus thirty one from Eubanks. Not to mention when, the plus fifty five from out. Mitchell. Just, I, I'm wow. saying, if you get just pegged the guy who's going to score seventy one, I think you got a good shot. 
I think you can run that negative and 100. Right there. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. 71 real points. How you like That's, this? I mean, the common thread on all this is the plus 62, right? That's the common thread on all these lineups is getting a nice little plus 62 in there and makes things a lot easier. You that can play because that's what Mitchell was, right? <clears throat> yeah. If you play Alondis Williams, you can run a Luca Lillard, Shea, Jeremy Grant, and Alondis Williams lineup and champion. I mean, you just but you need to get you, all four of those other guys to hit their 100. upside projections versus their means. Yeah, yes. yeah. I guess that's what it brings. So, like, this is back to the whole. Sometimes, like, we're talking about a strategy right now, but, you know, the data part of me goes, this is a very, very noisy conversation because all of this, the conversation is happening because we had a crazy, like, I'm not saying that, like, again, that Mitchell, it was it was absurd, that will never happen again, but, you know, you got a top 0.1% outcome from Donovan Mitchell. So, mm -hmm. like, if you can make sure that you know who's going to do that, then the strategy is viable. Otherwise, you know, you're probably better spacing out the projectable points elsewhere and not, you know, wasting it on a minus three, I guess. But you don't, I don't think you necessarily need to peg the 99th percentile outcome. If you have three guys that are in the 80th percentile. Yeah. Let me see this real quick. If we have, let me, let me go back to the one that I played with Terry Taylor. Cause I think it was a half decent lineup. While you do that, I'm just going to point out for those of you who are watching, Sorry for those who are listening, but now on our on the sober data results page, we have the summary of what you're going to win, as well as the uh, point totals of all of your players. I think that includes all comments, so it's probably going to be everyone there. But that's something we've had on the football side for a while. It's now on the NBA side, and I believe is in the app. Or if it's not in the app, it will be very soon. Anyway. Uh, Laird, do you want do you want to go real quick? Just go to game week uh, twenty in my limited contender and we can get y'all's take on that because i did do it limited contender in game week 20. yeah there you go oh yeah didn't a lot of people play game... this week and can that week in contender or did i make that up who's that is, i can't who's believe me? you put this lineup in you're like i'm winning I did not. I literally had I bought an extra lead of flip and I couldn't get him going anywhere. And I had like Giannis and training with Kessler and Love. And I'm like, ah, oh, if I can just find somebody at a I think it was a two, I can play this lineup somewhere. And I went to the Sower FP projections, sorted down, and I'm like, oh, Terry Taylor is a one. Was this worth two dollars and nineteen cents for you? Yeah, I mean, I, we're talking about it for content, so sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was, but my honest thought was like, and like Giannis had, uh, I don't remember why I played. I remember, I think it was after lock, everybody got ruled out. So I was like, oh man, Giannis might be able to pull. Yeah, because, okay, remember this is the week that Laird, I was convinced that Rudy was going to go nuts on the Heat. On the Heat. Because the Heat didn't have Bam. They, they had. Or Dead uh, Man or someone else. Yeah, so it was. God, I don't remember who they started at center, but it was like, I mean, Orlando Robinson did well, but it was somebody else. And I'm like, oh man, Gobert should go nuts on this. Jovic did not. Well, yeah, I think Jovic started was, that game. He was really bad. There yeah, I mean, you would think a max salary cap center versus a guy that's not a center should be good, but it's Rudy Gobert. It's Rudy Gobert. Yeah, he's moving into the IKV territory, unfortunately. God. Yeah. He's like, way, I mean, I mean, wants a Gobert rare card. But, I have one available for sale. Yeah. So just on that results, though, I mean, like everybody on there outproduced. I mean, you know, your argument for the why Taylor doesn't work there is that Lee um, upside maybe was that was before like Shamit was like obviously the the play. I was like you didn't know if Shamit or Lee would be the one to get the starting nod or to get more of the usage, but you know. Like there was upside to be had here, but you didn't have the jamming the multiple guys, and you didn't get the upside results for anybody except for Giannis. So. Yeah, that's fair. So it can work, and then it right here, it can also not. <laughs> I, yeah, I think the problem ultimately with all of these is that 
everything is just like, a, oh yeah, it can work. And we just don't have nearly enough data to like be like, this is the way you should play. And I'm not even sure we ever get to that point. Well, like that guy wins with that lineup. Let's just say he wins with that lineup. That does not mean that that is now right. the lineup construction. Because if you give me, if you do Clay Thompson on a plus thirty or forty, Donovan Mitchell on a plus sixty-two, and Green on a plus whatever, congratulations, you should redo that again and win again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do we need more data? No, we do not need more data. But more data is more fun for Alex. Says who? I'll gladly intake more data. I don't want to put any more out. Right. Well, I'm saying more data to have to, you know, smooth out projections, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. I guess it's possible that we just five years from now, we have like, oh, this is, these were all the results from limited contender. What are your, uh, what are your conclusions? And you're like, it depends. And maybe we actually don't need more data because we could just say that right now. But do you know what the craziest thing in that that time frame is? It's going to be a completely different game because now the amount of entries needed. So, like, having the guy that on a one that does a ten becomes like that much crucial yeah, way yeah. in the future than <laughs> it does now. Yeah, the day, the day that you have to like hit the nuts. It feels right now like it feels it, already. Yeah, yeah but feels, this is the easiest. Like, it's. Yeah. This is the easiest right. it's going to be. That's yeah, the craziest yeah. thing about this game is every week that goes by, it's going to get harder. And every week that goes by, they're not adding more rewards, which is fine. I, don't, I mean, there'll be more I'm, when they're... I'm not, when they're yeah, better. eventually when there's more people, but it already feels like... My lineup, my rare champ lineup last week, I was like, this is a good lineup. It was like, I snuck into tier five. I got my Jaden Springer, and then now I got to just roll those those punt lineups. Yeah. yeah. Barkley said, I feel like ceiling games are something overlooked because I'd rather take a dude who projects for plus five but has a plus 15 ceiling than the one who projects for eight but has a lower ceiling. Completely agree. And uh, Alex does that on Sora first pitch. We're going to have that soon on Sora data. It's yep. not quite the same, but it's – something that at least shows more of a range as opposed to just a straight projection. Um, so Larry, can I ask Alex one point. more question? I, I know the answer, but I wanted to say it for the sake of, we'll wrap up talking about projections. Alex, what projection do you put more weight on? Their average or median, whichever one you want to say, average or median, points per game, or their upside projection? Upside. 100%. I used to, I used to just uh, maximize my upside points and then... I kind of actually, so you want to know what I use? Mm -hmm. It's, I use points added, which is, it's only a, a very little difference, but it's just the upside minus the L10. So not just raw okay. points out of upside, but like upside minus. So that way I'm not getting as many of like the, the top, top end and trying to force those guys in and killing the bottom end, but just trying to find where those biggest pluses are margins. Okay. So I knew that upside was your answer. And I thought that was a good little tie in with his because, you know, like this is not like the solar data one shows the, the average projection right now. Like you said, they're, they're working in the upside. It's really good to have the average. But I do think the reality behind this game, because these all are for DFS people, they know this term, it's all GPP. But these are all big, big field tournaments with very tiny, you know, prizes that really matter. Like, it's really nice to win tier fives and tiers, tier, I guess they're not tier sixes, but it's really nice to win fours and fives, but you actually make make hay in this game by winning tier ones. So you should always be trying to maximize your upside of getting a tier one versus just sneaking in for a tier five isn't going to get it cut, you know, yeah, long term. It, a tier one pays itself much more than 10 tier fives, usually, at least in the short term. Except for tier two, I would advise staying away from the Golden State tier two forward congratulations on your back-to-back -back andrew wiggins rare card wins Keith. thank you thank you yeah. top half of tier two i was like surely this is not about to happen again <laughs> yeah when they have the rare wiggins tournaments though you'll dominate so you'll be fine <laughs> hey i'm just like 
I'm he's my Dwayne Dedman though. I keep getting the darn uh Andrew Wiggins illness still out. It's like, man, how long is he sick for? (laughs) Thank you to everybody who has joined us live. If you guys have not uh, hit the like button on the video, it would be greatly appreciated if you did. Same thing to the subscribe button. Um, we're like I said, we're going to come out with a bunch more content on this channel. So um, subscribe, and you will get all of it. Um, gentlemen, thank you for all of that. If, as a reminder, check out sort of our first pitch. Alex does the projections. You can complain to him when he projects somebody for twenty nine and they only score twenty six. He he is at fault. So he will take it. He loves it. But yeah, check that out. Sort of first pitch on Twitter is probably the best place to start. Follow that. Uh, there's also uh, YouTube and TikTok. Did I see so rare first pitch TikTok? I'm yeah, too old for that, but I'm sure all you young people will love it. So go check that out. Gentlemen, thank you and uh, good luck this week and this weekend.